So thank you all for being here. This is a great crowd. I want to especially thank the folks who were outside exercising their civic duty and demonstrating today with care and compassion for not only our community but the world. And we're glad to have you here this, this afternoon with us. Um, I am from, um, let's, let's see, UVM faculty and staff unions, United Academics and UVM Staff United have organized this event, recognizing that many issues in the 2024 mayoral race bear upon our community as institutions and individuals. Together, our two unions represent roughly 2,500 faculty and staff members at UVM. In addition to our members, we are also pleased to welcome undergraduate and graduate students and members of the Burlington community. Thank you all for being here. So before we begin, um, we have a few logistics to cover. Our goal is to have a respectful event. We appreciate everyone allowing the candidates to speak and everyone speaking, both candidates and folks who have questions. Um, and we will act with respect out of one, for one another and our community here. I have no doubt that that's what will happen here. Um, the format for the debate is as follows. Each candidate can give a brief opening statement for about two to three minutes. Sorry about that. We will then ask questions, uh, alternating who goes first. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer, and then one minute follow-ups for each. If needed, the moderator can ask each candidate a question if they have avoided answering any part of it. Uh, candidates will have one minute each. Candidates will have two minutes at the end to make a summary statement. In addition to the questions that we have prepared, audience members can submit written questions on the cards provided. Many of you have already done that, so thank you. Um, please pass them to the center aisle, although you, you may have done that already. Oh, you're looking for them? Oh, okay. They will be, they will be collected. Um, we'll collect them periodically and review them and pass them to the moderator. Okay, and the statement from UVM policy that I need to read is, this event is sponsored by United Academics and UVM Staff United. The use of the University of Vermont's facilities for this event does not constitute an endorsement by the university. The University of Vermont does not endorse candidates or organizations or any other candidates or organizations in connection with this or any other political campaign or election. Okay, we're going to start with the usual ceremonial coin to us to see who goes first. <laughs> it's not a loaded quarter. <laughs> Heads or tails? Heads. Tails. I don't want to get it in the water. <laughs> Heads it is. First question. I have to save my quarter. Okay. And the first question is, how can labor unions in our community be better supported by the legislature and by employers? And as mayor, how will you work to support unions in achieving their goals? Susie, would you like us to do opening statements first? Yes. Is yeah, do an opening, opening statement. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is this on? Today. Are we on? All right. Okay, great. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I'm a mom of two small kids. I've lived in the Old North End for nearly 20 years. I'm a very proud former labor organizer with the la uh, largest labor union in the, the state of Vermont, Vermont NEA. I worked there for over a decade. I'm a proud former union member of 11 years, and now I run a small business where labor unions are part of my clientele. I'm a former city councilor here in Burlington and currently a state legislator representing a portion of the Old North End and New North End. 
I've been proudly endorsed by two medical and mental health professional unions, SEIU, CIR, which represents the residents and interns at UVM Medical Center, AFSCME Local 1674, who represent the mental health professionals who support our entire county on critical mental and human services. The endorsements represent hundreds of critical professionals in our community, and today I'm proud to receive yet another endorsement by local uh, UE Local 203 that represents the city market um, workers. I'm really proud to be back on campus. I've done a lot of labor organizing here. As a young 24-year-old, I stood in solidarity with UVM students doing hunger strikes to stand up for livable wages and dignity for workers on campus. I then went on um, to help organize one of the many attempts to organize the professional and clerical staff, which I'm so proud today are now UVM Staff United. I spent a whole year, I mean, congratulations, that's really hard work. Um, and then most recently, I've been back on campus to stand with the graduate students who also need the dignified respect to organize a union uh, for wages and, and, and benefits. I'm running for mayor because I have a deep love of Burlington. I grew up in central Vermont. Burlington was this big, exciting place. When I came back to the state after college, I knew this would be the place I would want to raise kids, where I would want to make my life. Um, it attracted me because it was vibrant and energized and super engaged. And I come from activist family, um, so the engagement here was like nothing I had experienced before. But I'm turning my attention from state policy making back to our city because I'm deeply concerned about the health and well-being of our city. I'm deeply concerned. There's a lot of fear and anxiety in our city, and as a mom of two small kids, I feel that. I feel that, that anxiety of what's the right thing to do, and yet I also see so many people suffering in the streets of Burlington, our neighbors, our Vermonters. And so I also see among city leadership a divisiveness that's permeating out of City Hall, where we're not doing our best work as leaders. We're not working together to really uh, tackle the complexities of these deep challenges facing our city. And these at challenges are issues that are Vermont challenges. They're not Burlington's challenges only to solve or to figure out the funding solutions for. And that is why I'm uniquely qualified as a state policymaker and former city councilor and organizer who knows how to convene people to get tough things done and to figure out a plan of action to move the city forward. I want to bring our community back to itself to reconnect, to bring the respect and dignity that we all know we can bring to really solving these complex challenges. I also know, as a policymaker, it is a, uh, a fundamental uh, need to really have evidence and use data and use practices that we know will work, and we can do short-term and long-term things at the same time uh, to find solutions that do not create more harm in our community. We really need to acknowledge that we have multiple crises uh, facing our city between community safety, between affordability, and livability for people and climate, and that's, those are the three big areas I'm running on. Um, for me, I, I am deeply concerned about, and I know people in this room have been impacted by the realities of our substance use disorder crisis, the number of people struggling with the opioid crisis in our state. I know there are people in this room who struggle with affordability, being able to live and work here in Burlington. I'm part of that affordability um, anxiety. I worry when I open my property tax bill, can we continue to make it work in Burlington? And that's on two really decent Vermont incomes. But with the challenging crush of childcare costs and the increased cost of um, local property tax and state property tax, it's becoming more and more um, real, real that we're going to lose the economic diversity that is so critical for Burlington, for students, for staff, for faculty, for everyone here in Burlington. I also see, as I said, many people suffering in our streets in Burlington, and that is why I'm sure we'll talk more about it, um, but when I talk about safety, I talk about community safety, because there's so many critical aspects to it. It's complex. I wish there could be just one solution to solve at all. That's an oversimplification of what got us here and what it will take to really build a city that is safe for all and a place where people um, feel safe and actually are safe in our community. And finally, in terms of livability, I talk very consciously about climate. That emergency is real. As a mom of a four and eight-year-old, there is no other urgency I feel than knowing that in 10 years, Burlington's would look dramatically different than it does today. The winters will look dramatically different. The lake, I don't know if it will be swimmable at all for my kids when they're not even ready to go off 
off to college. So that urgency is real. We need bolder action and climate as a city. We have to be transparent and honest about the kind of bigger ideas we need to bring to the table. We can't uh, resort back to status quo. It's not good enough, frankly, anymore. And what is also not good enough, and we need fresh perspectives, is knowing that to bring the city back together will require a fresh perspective and new ideas. And that's what I bring, will bring as mayor. That is what I will bring um, confidently as someone with the skills and experience as a state policymaker and a local uh, policymaker. And that is the kind of leadership that Burlington deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from City Councilor Joan Shannon. Thank you. Um, thank you to UVM United and the Lawrence Debate Union for hosting us here tonight. I'm Joan Shannon. I've been on the City Council for 20 years, um, which started kind of accidentally. I was trying to recruit somebody else to run. I was dissatisfied with being excluded from the process, had concerns about things that were happening in my own neighborhood and around the city. And as I tried to recruit recruit somebody else to run, I was recruited to run. And I said, I can't possibly run for city council. I have a baby, which was in my arms at that time. And they said, we'll babysit. And with that, I ran out of in excuses and ended up running for city council. And it's been a real privilege. Um, I've seen Burlington through a lot of difficult times during that period. I've seen Burlington through financial crises, um, through the Occupy movement, and through um, a, vari a variety of challenges over a period of years. I have served as city council president for three years. I've served under three mayors, two progressive mayors, one Democratic mayor. Um, I am a former small business owner. I owned a, a business making long torso swimwear. And I often say uh, Burlington Telecom ate my business um, at that time with the financial crises of the city and the amount of time it required to dig in and figure out how to pull Burlington out of that. Um, I actually gave up my business and um, and became a realtor after that, which is uh, what I currently do. Um, I'm also the mom of that baby who is now in college. And uh, she went through all of the Burlington schools, starting at, at Champlain, going to Edmonds, and graduating from Burlington High School um, in 2020. Um, I'm running because I really feel that Burlington is at a pivotal point, and I think uh, a lot of people say that, and um, we feel a real change here since the pandemic, and we've, we've struggled with the same things that we've seen happening throughout the country, but Burlington used to be on the positive side of national trends, and it does not feel or even statistically show that we are on the positive side of the current negative trends. Um, I have faced challenging times as a, as a city councilor, and I've stood against strong political winds uh, to do what I believed was right. In 2020, um, after the murder of George Floyd, we faced a racial reckoning. And as part of that racial reckoning, there was an effort to defund the police. And while I very much appreciate the movement and think that we need to do more to create justice in this world and in our city, I did not agree with that action, and I offered an alternative to doing that. Um, I didn't think that defunding the police, uh, going from 105 officers to 74 officers, um, which was proposed on a Thursday or a Friday and voted on a Monday, I didn't think that that was the way to make that kind of a decision. I think that we need process and we need to be rational when we're making important decisions. Um, and we failed to do that. And even when we came back and several times asked to reverse that, we failed to get the votes to reverse it until we were in a very dire situation that we remain in today. Um, 
I want to say that, that I do want Burlington to be a healthy and safe community. I want Burlington to be an affordable community, and I want Burlington to be a vibrant and inclusive com community. I agree that there's too much divisiveness in our community, and I certainly feel it personally. <laughs> um, a lot of that has been directed towards me. I have tried to run um, a campaign that is positive. Um, I have asked my supporters to run a campaign that is positive, and I hope that we are meeting that standard. I'm very proud, while I'm not a union organizer, that's not my background, I still have all four union endorsements from all four city unions. I have the endorsement of the police, the fire, AFSME, who represents 300 members across all city departments, and the IBEW Electrical Union. Um, I value all of you here up at UVM, faculty and students. I value our workers. I value our downtown, our neighborhoods, our institutions, and most of all, I value our sense of community. I want all of us to work together to heal, restore, and celebrate our Burlington. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. So what's going to happen now is we're going to go back and forth with questions, and after each question, the other person will get a chance to respond for one minute. I also want to say... Susie, check the mic. It's on the... You've got to hold it right up. Okay. These are how many questions we have. <laughs> How many people want to stay to midnight? <laughs> so just remember, too, that we have a lot of questions here, and we have some of our own questions, so we'll do our best to get as many done as possible. Thank you for that. So Emma won the famous toss. And our first question is, can both candidates explain why they have not called for a ceasefire and an end to the occupation of Palestine, despite overwhelming legal, empirical, and historical evidence that has committed genocide and other crimes against humanity. And that is occupation, which is illegal. Emma? Thank you for the question. Is that close enough? Okay, I'll get the hang of this. Thank you for the question. Um, I have called for a bilateral ceasefire. I was raised by activists who have a deep commitment to the peace movement and to anti-violence, and the only way we can do that is to call for a bilateral ceasefire to protect the innocent people who are in harm's way, have been harmed, have been killed um, with what's going on in Palestine and Israel. Um, that's the only way that we create peace, but it has to include um, ending terrorism, uh, ending the attacks by Hamas, returning the hostages, and also ending is Israel's military siege um, uh, involved in that region. I, I really truly believe in peace. As I said, it is a framework for which I was raised. Um, I have been to so many p uh, peace protests against every war uh, that, I, that has happened since in my 43 years on this planet. It, is, it runs through me. I don't serve on city council right now. What I will say, if this question is also alluding to the questions, um, I think I really firmly also believe in our direct democracy process that we have under our charter. And what that requires, is <laughs> What that requires is due diligence by the mayor and city council to review our charter to make sure that the requirements are met. And when the requirements are met, met, that is the only question that is being asked of the city council and mayor. And then it should go to the community where hopefully we can have the real conversation and build the real relationships. And I want to emphasize as an organizer, there is so much harm going on. And when we, uh, we have to take that seriously um, as leaders to make sure we can have the critical conversations we need um, within the community when a question like this is coming to um, to voters. It should have gone to voters, and we should be having deeper conversations to to um, address and uh, address and heal the harm that has happened in our community over this very critical conversation, uh, because there's so there's so much at risk. So, th thank you, Joan. Thank you. Um, I did support a resolution that called for peace between Israel and Palestine, and I do support freedom for the Palestinian people. Um, 
I oppose violence and the war that is happening in Gaza, and I believe that the hostages should be returned. Um, I firmly stand against anti-Semitism as well, and I'm concerned for our Jewish community. Um, I also uh, agree with um, and support a bilateral negotiated ceasefire. Thank you. Now you, you mentioned occupation, the word occupation. The word occupation was in the question. Order, please. Oh. Okay, we're, we're all good. It's okay. You have to... You have to also appreciate the difficulty of reading your handwritings. I am doing my very best. I'm not leading, leading anything out on purpose. Could, do you want to respond to Joan, and then Joan can respond to you? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, I appreciate uh, that what I've been saying since I got into this race around the values of peace and the need to be ever evolving with what's evolving in the Middle East um, is uh, resonating with Councillor Shannon. Um, I think it's it's really critical. Again, I want to emphasize that the city council uh, should, and mayor should not be gatekeeping uh, questions that uh, are rightfully signatures are rightfully collected and should be going to voters. It is, if city councilors and leaders want to engage in that conversation, you do that alongside neighbors and the conversations leading up to the election, but we should not gatekeep the ballot. Thank you, Joan. Um, thank you. We have an obligation as city councilors to serve the common good, and with this question of what goes on the ballot specifically, we have an obligation to consider the common good. Um, a similar case to this was the rebels in South Burlington, where the, there was a, um, a petition to put the rebel name on the ballot, a name which was associated with racism and which had been changed because of its association with racism. A lot of people didn't like that change. They petitioned. They wanted the, the name put on the ballot for people to vote on, and the council voted no on that. And there was a court decision that upheld the council's right to make that decision. I think that we have to consider impacts on our local community. I think that we have to consider when a minority is being victimized, potentially, by a question that's on the ballot. And I initially was planning to vote yes on putting that question on the ballot. I decided not to because of the harm that I was persuaded would be caused in our local community to a local minority. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question has a word I've never seen before, so if I say it wrong, whoever wrote it, please tell me the proper pronunciation. The Israeli human rights organization, Betzalem? All right, okay. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have all declared Israel an apartheid state. Candidate Shannon, why did you block the people of Burlington's democratic apartheid-free referendum? Candidate Mulvaney Stanek, will you publicly support the people's desire for an apartheid-free referendum? We'll start with Joan on this one. Um, thank you. I think I just answered this question, but um, <clears throat> when we have a question on the ballot, we have to consider the common good, we have to consider impacts to the minority, and we have to consider if there's harm being done to our community by having this question on the ballot. Generally, I think unless you have a good reason not to, you should put a question on the ballot if it's petitioned. But there are a lot of people in our community who explain to us how it would harm them. I think we should listen to minority minority groups in our community when they're telling us that something is harmful to them. And for that reason, I voted no. Thank you. Candidate Mulvaney Stanek. Thank you. Um, I'm a big believer in yes and. We can do multiple things at the same time. We can respect democ direct democracy. And to this question, I believe I also addressed it already. Um, the referendum received enough signatures that should go right on the ballot. A and we can be having those critical conversations and should be helping as leaders in our city to make sure that all impacted people, because there's multiple p folks who've been harmed by this large conversation, can be held with the care that they deserve to really work towards understanding. We create more harm when we 
take sides on any particular issue. So our job is to create a community of care, a community where we can dialogue. And the, the sad reality is the divisiveness coming out of City Hall for years now made for this issue to be even more heightened. I mean, it's heightened already given the international and long, long history that could take hours to even go into. Um, but the fact that our city leaders have not been taking care of creating a community that's safe to have these critical conversations together um, led to a very uh, a tinderbox situation in City Hall and then later even more harm we can't even hold this critical conversation together. So I would be the mayor who would understand that and really try to engage folks in safe ways where you can have small communities of dialogue. I've actually reached out to um, leaders in the Jewish community and Palestinians to start building those relationships. Win or lose, that's how I operate and it's incredible, incredibly important for me to continue to learn, to have the humbleness to know I don't don't barely need, know all the complexities of this very long struggle, but that's the kind of leadership, again, I will offer the city and model here in the city around building open relationships long before we're in crisis mode so that we can weather this together and come forward and, and frankly model for our children how we should be having these critical conversations. Joan, you have one minute for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, I agree that we need to have these conversations, but I don't think a binary ballot item is necessarily the best way to have those conversations. I also have been engaging with people, with both the Jewish community and those in support of, um, of Palestinian rights on this issue, trying to figure out a way that we can have a productive conversation in our community that isn't harmful, that's honest, and where people don't feel threatened. Thank you. Thank you. Emma, your question? F-35s are being used in Israel's offensive against Gaza, and F-35s in Burlington are causing hearing, learning, mental health impacts due to the noise toxicity. If you become mayor of Burlington, what will you do to stop these impacts and take a stand against harming children? How have your votes in the legislature and on the Burlington City Council demonstrated a willingness to hear from concerned citizens on issues of militarization here and internationally. Thank you. There's a lot in that question, so I will do my best to address that. Since the beginning of F-35s, uh, again, because I, I am consistent in my values, how I was raised, I think it's incredibly important of how I look at the world, and knowing that even on a local level, we have uh, an opportunity to build a community that has less violence and is committed to peace. And so I've always been opposed to F-35s. In the beginning, long before I knew the public health impacts and the community impacts it would have not only on Burlington, but our surrounding communities, but just in the beginning, fundamentally, uh, from a commitment to um, anti-war and demilitarizing demil our community and uh, really understanding the military industrial complex and how much money and reallocation of resources should be going the opposite direction from the military. The fact that the F-35s, um, the cost alone is astounding to me when we struggle to fund our public schools, when we struggle to uh, fix our wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> It is a major, it's, there's so many elements that the F-35s to me represent, uh, which is a misalignment with what I think, I know my core values are, and I think the core values of most folks here in Vermont, especially now, speed up to today, uh, the dramatic impact on quality of life, on public health, on communities. I lived in Winooski briefly when I first met my wife to make sure that we wanted to get married, and I could not believe how loud it is in Winooski, and how loud it still is even in the old North End. And so this has a dramatic impact on the quality of life for not only children, but their hearing for um, for all folks, actually, for that matter. Not to ma not to mention the the rippling effects of trauma from folks coming from war torn areas who are already making Vermont their home. This is very real and has to be taken seriously. There are other options. There are other options for our National Guard. This is not a, a binary choice. The, we can work with our partners at the National Guard to seek a different mission. We can work with our federal delegation to pressure it that way. This is not a binary choice about jobs. Or, or doing the right thing, if we could, we just don't want to lose the jobs. And so I have been very consistent on this issue. I've been proud to be so. Uh, and I think this is a very important question for the mayor to see how they're going to partner with pushing for a different mission assignment for the National Guard. Thank you very much. Joan? Thank you, Susie. Um, 
I actually have never been a fan of the F-35s, and I wrote the resolution that asked for a different mission um, that was passed by the city council in a nine to three vote. We asked the secretary of the Air Force um, for, for a different mission that wouldn't have the negative impacts on our community that the F-35s have. I worked at the Chase Mill for many years when the F-16s were flying, and we couldn't talk on the phone when the F-16s flew, flew overhead, and the F-35s are the same and worse. Um, so I'm not a fan of the F-35s. However, I am a fan of the airport. I, I am a fan of supporting our economy here in Vermont, and that requires the military um, contributing to our airport. They contribute about $3 million a year for fire services at the airport, and the airport isn't really functional without that contribution from the military, and that is the difficulty that we have. And if it were as easy as, as uh, you know, just getting another mission, that would have been done. It isn't. And I'd like to know, I did make an effort to get another mission here. I led the effort to get another mission here, and I made sure that we got a response from the Secretary of the Air Force and worked with our congressional uh, delegation to get that response. And I'd like to know, um, I think the question was, what uh, what have you done in the legislature? Um, this is the, you know, our airport serves Vermont. And what has the legislature, or you in the legislature, um, and I don't know if this is appropriate to ask questions in this way, so I'll leave it to you. Okay. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we have one minute for rebuttal on either side. Emma. So I think resolutions can be very performative, um, and that's the danger of resolutions. What direct action, well, an opportunity for direct action for me when it comes to the airport in particular is when a lease reopens, which it just did a few months ago, uh, for an opportunity to ask these questions and to use the leverage of the city um, to, to affect change. And what instead happened was a very um, poor process that got rushed through, and now we're in a 50-year lease where some of these larger questions around um, how we engage with National Guard, how the money arrangement could have been maybe rethought. I spent five minutes on Google and found other municipal airports have a different financial arrangement, and that's in five minutes of trying to collect information. <laughs> if... <laughs> If our, if our leadership is committed to doing um, a resolution, and Councillor Shannon, if you're committed to doing resolutions to try to get a different mission, we still have the same mission, and why in the world do we, do we not use that big opportunity with the airport lease uh, reopening to really think about community benefits and impact and the future needs of our community? Thank you. Joan? Thank you. Um, what, the reason we extended that lease was because we needed $52 million of investment in our airport, including $8 million that was going towards energy efficiency. That's what was at risk by not signing that lease. Could we have gotten something different? Yes. Something better? I don't think that there's reason to believe that. But I have yet to hear anything done in the legislature to address what is very much a regional issue. Respond to that? Yes, yeah, so, since you directly addressed her, she can respond. Well, you asked me twice, so I'm going to give you an answer. Um, so I pushed to try to get a, a hearing on F-35 resolution. It was resisted by Democratic leadership. Um, I, I, I also took leadership because our legislative delegation does not have a working relationship with city government. We've passed eight, nine, eight, eight or nine charters in the last two to three years, and the airport commission composition was one of that, which is sounds wonky, but it's critical to give other towns a seat on our airport commission to have a little bit more say in the impacts on their community because it's not a regional airport tech structurally so this gives them a little more say and because no one else was taking that lead I took that lead and got that charter change across the finish line so Winooski could have a seat that's what I've done it was it was the city council that put that charter change on the ballot, got it passed on the ballot, that added both, both well, South Burlington was already on the commission and added Winooski to the commission. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. 
How are you going to ensure Burlingtonians' money is divested away from Israel and war in general and toward care for residents? And Joan, I think you're first this time. Um, I'm not aware what, that's not something that we've been asked to do and I'm not aware what money in Burlington is invested at this time. I, I don't support um, taxpayer funds going to this war. I support Bernie's position on that. Um, though I do support, uh, I support giving money to the Ukrainians um, to defend themselves, and I think it's unfortunate that those two things are bound together. Emma? So divestment is one tactic, not to use organizer talk, but it's one tactic. Um, and I would want to understand how much of Burlington resources are invested in. I think it's a very important question because it is one of the levers, the, the, the ta um, uh, impacts we could have on trying to affect change. And so I want to know how much is actually invested um, and know if that's the only option. I also want to know how the city has been working with the federal delegation, which ultimately has the most influence on what the US government is doing or not. Um, and divestment is effective strategy sometimes, and if that if there is a significant amount of funds, then it seems worthwhile. Um, when I was on city council, I advanced a resolution to um, to divest our money with the state of Arizona. It feels like ancient history now, but there was a legalized racial profiling happening for undocumented people in Arizona at the time, and I wanted to make sure, even if it was a small drop in the bucket, that Burlington's money was not being um, spent in Arizona as an as a, a tactic to make sure that our statement was clear about racism and clear about the impact and the interconnectedness of Burlington with other parts of the country and the world. So I look forward. The biggest piece about these big questions, by the way, these debate formats, there's no dialogue with all of you. So I would really welcome a chance to have a conversation after tonight to get into the weeds on all of this because that is, as I said before, I am humble enough to admit that I don't know all the details. I don't know how much money is invested um, within the city government with, within Israel or other relationships. I think we need to go deeper than that because it may be more that we need to be thinking about. Out. And I also think we need a critical eye when it comes to things like Ukraine, because I'll say as a, as a state legislator, that's sailed through the legislature, but we've never raised the same level of concern and funding and connection with black and brown countries um, around the world when they've been in struggle and connected to Burlington. And I'm done. I have 30 seconds. Oh, and so... And so I just want to say, we can't pick and choose the struggles here. We can't pick and choose. If our values are really to be anti-racist, if our values are to be anti-war, then we have to have dialogue so we're not um, rushing these conversations through and working. I really do mean that. I would love to, work, to meet with people so we're not doing this very bizarre way of answering these questions. Thank you. Joan, you have one minute to rebut. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Emma, do you want to... Rebut? Move on. Move on, okay. How are we doing so far? Come on, let's have a little noise. How are we doing so far? We have two good candidates up here doing their best, so we need to support them too. Okay, as mayor, what would you do to solve the Decker Towers situation? First of all, I, I want to take a deep breath, and when I said before my opening statement that there's suffering happening in Burlington, there is deep suffering happening at Decker Towers, and I'm deeply concerned because folks who um, are already struggling with a lot of the realities of, of, of economics, right, low and moderate income folks, folks living with disabilities, um, folks who are simply just trying to live their lives are in a deep crisis there, and I feel the city has failed these folks. Um, the other larger reality is that we're facing a record number of of unhoused people in Burlington and in the state. When I say that these challenges are not Burlington's alone, I mean that. This is because the state failed with our motel um, emergency program um, and abruptly evicted hundreds of people into the streets of Vermont. And where would you go? I grew up in Barrie. I would not stay in Barrie if I were unhoused. I would re relocate to the biggest city because Barrie has no grocery store downtown. It has no public transportation system. It would be a, a much harder to survive on the streets of Barrie. So now we're shouldering and holding this immense amount of suffering of Vermonters. And where would you go when you have no access to public um, bathrooms even? The dignity of these folks has been lost in this great struggle. And of course, they're finding their way to the places where you can try to survive, frankly. So a couple things. I think this is, 
I hope we get into more questions on this because uh, we need to have short-term and long-term solutions to help folks who are unhoused. Um, they're all unhoused people are not the same. There's, they're not a monolith. It's important to understand that we need a diversity set of options on the table to get people the emergency housing that they deserve um, and work with our partners in the t and in their surrounding towns and on the state level to really figure this out, reallocate money. This is the pr funding priority right now. It is not other, other um, in the city and the state for that matter. It should, this is um, a four alarm fire, if you will, to help these folks. The other thing I want to end before, uh, before I run out of time is that the residents of Decker Tower deserved a much more dignified response from the city. When I read that seven days article and read what our current mayor, um, what, how they treated, how he treated and chose to engage with folks in Decker Tower, felt um, whiffs of classism, it w felt whiffs of, of deep disrespect, and these folks deserve a partner in solving these solutions. They're complicated, they're not easy, but they really truly deserve um, a much uh, different response that's one of care and, and problem solving and saddling on up and saying, I'm in this with you together. Thank you, Emma Joan. Um, thank you. I have met with the director of BHA about Decker Towers and heard the concerns from, from his side. I have gone to Decker Towers. Um, people have reached out to me from Decker Towers to ask for help. I went there the night that they were um, voting to elect a resident council and I applaud them for, for doing that to try and address the concerns with it, to have a community approach to the issues that they face. Um, one of the issues that they face is that they have drug dealers inside the building. And the drug dealers inside the building are allowing people to come into the building who are purchasing drugs and doing drugs in the building. And Decker Towers can't keep them out because they are invited in by residents there. So the management of Decker Towers has been very challenged to evict drug dealers from the people who are causing problems inside. They haven't been able to evict people in a timely manner. It's taken, it's taken too long. And um, so people within the building are being victimized by this inability to get evictions, which is um, a problem with Vermont's laws. Uh, in addition, they need police support for what is happening inside the building. People are at risk. People are, um, they feel under siege all day long. And they deserve that police response, and Burlington is in a poor position to give them that response because of our shortage of police officers. Uh, we do need to partner with the residents and management of Decker Towers to address these issues as best as they can. They have you know, sent us notice that they are reliant on our police in order to have effective security, and I'd like to be able to provide that to them. Thank you. Emma? I would just add that we need uh we need to have an eviction process that works for the folks causing the most harm. Um, in this case, the folks who are dealing, I would agree with that. But in order to have a working um, a working system, we have to acknowledge that we have um, partnerships that are not working right now between the court system, um, between our police, and between our city. And so we have to have uh, leadership that makes sure that these ent these vital parts of our, our system are actually working together to move people out of who are causing harm. Um, this repeatedly happens. It's not just Decker Towers. It has happened in the building next to me where I live in the old North End. Um, and we should be able to learn and bring partners together, meet with the most impacted people to understand where this system can be improved upon, and make sure most fundamentally that people are being heard. Um, and then the leaders, including the police, including the folks working in our court system and the city council, need to work in service to our communities, understanding that the, um, the impact this has on people's everyday lives. I also know that the police are not the end all to any of these solutions. This is really important one to repeat. I'm out of time, so we'll come back to police, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, I'll just say that, that one of the things that Decker Towers needs is a police response, and we're not in a position to provide that response. But as mayor, I think that I am in the best position to recruit the officers that are needed, not only by Decker Towers, but other buildings that are just like Decker Towers, having the same problems as Decker Towers, unable to get the police response that they need. Uh, property homeowners and, and renters who have somebody who is threatening them, trying to break into their apartment or their house, not getting the police response that they need. I have the endorsement of the police. Our police need to know that they are supported by the community when they're doing their job according to their directives and their training. And I, um, I think that we need to rebuild our police department as well as provide other services in our community. Thank you. How can labor unions in our community be better supported by the legislature and by employers? And as mayor, how would you work to support unions in achieving their goals? I've lost track of this first. I think Joe was first. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the labor unions that I work closest with are the city unions, and I do have the support of all four city unions. One of the things that, um, you know, they have said, that all four of them have said is important to them is public safety, and for that reason they are endorsing me, as well as um, I, I value workers, I value their opinions, and I reach out to them to get their opinion about city policy. And that's also been a, a factor in their support for me. Recently, um, we had the UV, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the union, but the UVM um, medical workers came to us explaining to us the really dire situation that they were in, in longtime workers unable to afford their housing and unable to meet their needs, having full-time jobs for very long periods of time. And I um, was a co-sponsor on a resolution in support of those workers, that they they should be treated with dignity, that they should get wages um, that allow them to support their families. And, uh, you know, I... I think that we have increasing wealth disparity in this country, um, in the state, and in our city, and that this is a very significant problem. We need more support for our workers, and I am grateful to have their endorsement. Thank you, Thank you. Emma. Thank you. Did you know that Burlington has 22 unions? Yeah. 22 unions that represent thousands of workers in the city. And the vast majority of them actually don't endorse in local elections. I think that's an important um, fact to say. Um, and these, these range from the NEA, the AFT, United Electrical Workers, the Teamsters, VSEA, the Laborers, UFCW, which organized recently Ben and Jerry's. Uh, and these are just some of, some of these uh, vital unions that help um, represent uh, the working folks of Burlington and around. I said this in my opening. I have a very proud union history. Um, not only am I the daughter of a 40-year state employee who was the president of the State Employees Union, I on my own decided to dedicate my career to working people. And in my first job at the Peace and Justice Center, when I was about 25, 26 years old, I led the Burlington Livable City Coalition that worked with the AFSCME um, Local 1343, which is the City um, Employees Union, and also the custodial and uh, food service workers in the Burlington school system, and the local NEA, to actually establish livable wages. They were not being paid anywhere near a livable wage. It was a two-year campaign, multiple unions and coalitions that I led um, used uh, consistent pressure on the school board and on the other employers to actually raise the wage, wage raise the wage so that folks could have dignified wages in our city and have one more opportunity to try to afford to stay and, and live here. I went on to serve on the city's pension task force at 27. I barely knew what a pension was, but I schooled myself on that to make sure I understood a critical concept of defined benefit versus defined contract. Contribution. And that was really, um, at the time, because of the funding of the recession, or funding issues during the recession, a real chance that city workers would be moved over to a defined contribution plan. That would have hurt city workers. I fought back, and I said, we need a defined benefit plan. That is what has been promised to these workers. And then speed ahead the clock, and I continue to fight for public pensions to protect that for state workers and teachers in the state legislature. To your question, Susie Doe, about how, as mayor, you make it easier for people on working people and unions, 
You allow it to be an easier process to organize a union. And I have introduced a House bill to do just that for public sector workers. It simplifies the process um, so that folks can get their union and we can avoid uh, employer retaliation in the process of an organizing drive. But more importantly to mayor, um, the mayor needs to support working people. And that means standing up when there's not fair bargaining going on or when an employer, unfortunately like UVM, is trying to bust unions, which they're trying to intimidate the current graduate students. This is an important role. For a mayor who truly is dedicated to economic justice and defending economic diversity in our city needs to know that you have a role to play with bringing partners to the table, and that includes the president of UVM and any other employer who's not respecting the right to organize, not respecting fair bargaining, not respecting people being able to, even those without unions, have a respectful workplace where they can be dignified, earn wages and benefits, um, and be able to stay and live here in Burlington. Thank you, Emma. Joan, please. Thank you. The municipality of the city of Burlington has four unions, and the mayor's job is going to be most directly linked with those four unions. The police union, the fire union, AFSME, which represents 300 members, um, and uh, workers in, I think, all departments of the city, as well as the IBEW workers. Um, and these are the unions that are going to have a direct relationship with the mayor, have negotiations with the mayor, and these are the unions that have endorsed my candidacy. Thank you. Okay, do we want to rebut? That was the rebuttal. You both rebutted? Okay, good. Okay, next question. What do you see as the key issues between UVM and the city of Burlington? I think I'm first. <laughs> we'll just go with that. Is that yeah, I think I'm first. Okay, all right. It's hard to keep track. Um, so some of the key, sorry, the question again is the key between UVM and the city. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so some of the key issues, I mean, the big obvious one is the impact on housing. It has been for years in our city, um, but we obviously haven't gotten it right yet. And the recent MOU did not go further, f far enough to um, pressure the, the university to do the right thing and understand there is an important um, impact every time more housing is built here on campus. Uh, one of those pieces is understanding the need to have a cap on student enrollment uh, in order to, because the math just frankly doesn't work. When they increase housing, they've oh, in the last 10 years, they continue to increase um, the number of students they admit. And as a state legislator, I'm pretty concerned with the number of Vermont students, that percentage continues to drop. Nothing against out-of-state students, you're wonderful, we welcome you here to Vermont, but where is our commitment to also Vermont students at what is supposed to be a land-grant um, university? I also think that it's important to understand um, the, the f where we need to go further around UVM's relationship, a working relationship with the city. There needs to be more transparency, communication outside of the MOU that is ongoing to build a working relationship um, so that we can actually put even more things on the table to discuss as partners and not as adversaries. That includes reopening a child care center here on campus. They closed that three or four years ago. As someone who struggled to find child care that I felt was adequate, safe, and affordable, just, you know, eight years ago when my first kid went in, and just four years ago when my other kid went in, that impacts our community. That is not a small thing. Um, but also looking at, again, I mentioned this before as an employer, understanding that the UVM has a lot of critical jobs for folks in our region. One of the first people I met on my campaign um, was a new uh, professional staff person here on campus who moved from Maine to start a professional job in his 30s at UVM. I believe even we have a master's degree. He was denied three times a rental application to rent on his own and now has to live, live with roommates in order to afford on a UVM salary to live in Burlington. And that shouldn't be the case with one of our largest employers. Um, and so again, an opportunity to talk about um, employment and wage standards and understanding that this is a should be a symbiotic working relationship as the one of the largest employers on the Hill, but also the health of Burlington is as important to UVM as the health of UVM is important to Burlington. So we have to do so much better in that regard. Thank you. Joan, please. 
Um, I think that the issue of the moment, at least, is the UVM MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding with the with the city. UVM wants zoning changes, and I was actually, uh, you know, one of the first people to step up and say, if UVM wants zoning changes, this is our opportunity to start talking about um, enrollment. How? how this relates to our housing problem in Burlington. The only kind of housing that you could build, as far as I can think of, that would actually make our housing problem worse is to build housing for freshmen and sophomores and then make them fend for themselves in the community junior and senior year to find housing that is uh, completely unaffordable if it's available at all. Um, as the mom of a college student in a similar community, she's not in Burlington, but students are victimized all the time by this. And I see the struggle of students, parents, families to find housing for their kids. And UVM seems to be coming to the table now because I'm sure it's starting to impact their ability to enroll students at this point. But we need to have a conversation that's beneficial, not just to UVM and their ability to have the enrollment that they need um, to make UVM viable, but also for our community to to assure that our, there's housing not just for students but also for the faculty. I've helped many faculty members find housing in this community and I know that when UVM is trying to hire people, often they can't because of exactly what Emma just said, they can't find housing in this community. And I have stood up and said, I'm not going to hold a really firm line on necessarily a cap on enrollment, but at least demonstrate to us that you are going to make the situation better for our community that there will be that there, there will be more students living on campus and affordable housing on campus freeing up some housing in the neighborhood for faculty faculty students who graduate and we have to look at the graduate students in this program as well Emma please uh, I think the phrase is past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. And I think I got that right, but I think when it comes to housing, and again, when they've built more housing, I, don't, I can't trust that UVM will actually, um, uh, it will, will truly be committed to understanding its impact on the larger community without a student cap. And so I think it's a really critical thing when you look at the data, there are charts you can look at the student enrollment and how that's impacted. Um, in the area that I live in, the Old North End, uh, when I first bought my house 15 something years ago, um, there were never students in our part of the city. But it shows how much the how much of the um, affordability crisis is also impacting students that they're getting pushed further and further into into uh, deeper parts of the city, and the afford and the rents that these students are being asked to pay for. It's not just about faculty and staff. I'm also really mindful about the students, both on campus for that matter and off campus, because um, these students, um, especially those who are low and moderate income, low and moderate income students first-generation students, um, it's hard enough with how much it costs to pay the tuition here. But on top of that, we're creating even further harm for folks to start off their careers with being in so much debt. Um, and I would even, uh, I, I've even heard stories where some students are part of our unhoused population. Um, that is the stark reality. And so for UVM not to be able to understand the severity of that and to be able to come to the table with a deep commitment of fixing that and working with the city to do so, um, to me, that's where we've got to start. We've got to, to start with uh, what are our truly our values and commitment, and it has to be to students, to staff, and the greater community here in Burlington. Thank you. Joan? Thank you. Um, I should clarify, I do support a cap, but it's more than a cap because the MOU is only five years. And we need to have a longer view. The question I have asked is what is the long range plan for UVM? Because we need to be looking beyond five years. Uh, giving them a zoning change goes way beyond five years. Um, whatever it is that they're going to build is going to ha have a life way beyond five years. So what is that long term plan? And what are UVM's long term plans 
both for undergraduate and graduate students. Much of this conversation has really just been about the undergraduate students, but what about graduate students? They need a place to live too. And I know that, that part of the plans we've been presented are housing for, for um, graduate students, but we still need to have kind of a bigger picture, and I think really a more open dialogue. Um, you know, I want UVM to be successful. Burlington needs UVM to be successful. Uh, UVM adds, you know, an abundance of vibrancy to our community, and we want UVM to thrive. But I also share a concern about the shift from, um, from local students to more and more out-of-state students. Um, my family members were some of those out-of-state students, but we do need to be providing the services to our local Vermont students as well. Thank you. I'm noticing that there's a number of people standing in the back. We do have some seats in the front here and also some seats in between. If people who move over a little bit, they could be right on the end there. So please have a seat or not. You can see great from here. <laughs> up to you though, completely up to you. Okay, so we're in now the realm of UVM and the city. So from your point of view as a future mayor, how could UVM take a more active role in addressing the challenges Burlington is facing, including a shortfall of affordable housing, a shortage of childcare, continued cuts to public transportation, the opioid crisis, and the increase in violent crime? I'm sorry. It's Joan. You think I'm first? I do. Okay. Um, there is a lot in that question, um, and I don't think I have the answers to all of it, but I'm certainly um, open to what the suggestions of the community are. Uh, I haven't been running for mayor because I have all of the answers, but that I do believe that together we will find the answers. Um, to speak to some of that, I, I think that one of the real opportunities between UVM and the city and the region is with transportation. I, um, you know, UVM has CATMA and we have GMT, but really these are systems that could be better integrated and at times um, people in the community have been able to use the CATMA buses, buses at other times. We can't use the CATMA buses. To have an integrated transportation system, we should all be able to use each other's buses to get where we need to go. Um, and I think we'll have, all of us will have better bus service if we're, if we're able to do that. Uh, in terms of safety and security, I think that we also have a common interest here. And, um, you know, we, that could also be part of our MOU process to look at safety and security in the city, um, in the area around UVM. How can we work together better to address that problem? And as far as the opiates, there are, there's lots of research that is done at an institution like UVM. UVM and the Medical Center. I think that there are answers to our problems there. We need to be reliant on data. We need to be reliant on research. And we are in kind of a new age with our opiate epidemic as the epidemic has shifted from heroin to now fentanyl and xylazine. I think a lot of the data that we have is based on heroin and now this is changing. And what do we need to do to address those changes and how can um, UVM be a part of that research that we, we need. Also, um, we're looking at uh, safe injection sites, um, and that would be a pilot program. So we need a good way to evaluate the success of that program, and that's something else that UVM may be instrumental in helping us um, evaluate data around that in terms of not just uh, how many deaths do we prevent, but how many people do we get into treatment? What are the impacts on the greater community? Thanks. Thank you, Joan. Emma, please. Thank you. 
Um, Councilor Shannon, I'm glad that you brought up transportation because I've been actually talking about the real need for us to have a more vibrant and comprehensive transportation system that can actually make it work in Burlington since the beginning of this campaign. Um, and I've thought about this more deeply as I've been talking about this since the beginning because we see those empty buses go up and down East Avenue and elsewhere. And no, I know that that's one of those very smart partnerships that we can be leveraging more. And it need, we need to make sure that this transportation system is workable for people, that it covers the gaps that we currently have, that it continues to be free, but it also needs to be um, easy to use. I met with someone who his kid goes to the same elementary school that my kid goes to. It takes an hour and a half to go from basically the old east end down to the center of the, of the old north end on the current bus system in the morning. That is not usable for anyone. So while we have to partner, we have to be smart around really creating a whole hub and network that partners not only with the UVM, but other smart transportation systems that can really bring the creative, imaginative um, thinking that we need to have a vibrant public transportation system that obviously helps climate, but it also helps people get out of cars, quality of life, um, and helping working people at the same time. Um, I also think there was a safety question within that, and you know, it's larger than what's going on in Burlington. I know that on campus, that some of the, st for students in particular, issues of campus safety um, related to sexual violence and assault has been a growing concern here for years now. And so I've appreciated how UVM has, um, in some regards, tried to really support these students, and more can always be done. Um, but that is a piece of this uh, larger community safety conversation when I talk about um, the need to understand how comprehensive and wide, uh, widespread it is. I also appreciated, I've talked to the leadership of the UVM police, and I appreciate um, their approach in general to community safety with harm reduction and understanding it's not just about the numbers of police, it's about having a comprehensive um, safety system that that's, has social workers, has the right kind of professionals responding to the calls so that we can really um, have the kind of system that you all deserve. Um, and I know that they have uh, some really great things to offer. So I imagine that's another place for the, the Burlington Police Department to learn from other law enforcement leaders around best practices and being responsive to the kind of safety system we truly deserve and need in this city um, so that everyone can truly be safe and feel safe here. Thank you, Emma. Joan, please, rebuttal. No rebuttal. Emma, additional minute for rebuttal. Um, I would just also, uh, I would just also emphasize that uh, I do agree with Councilor Shannon, and I've been talking about how important it is to have better, meaningful community engagement um, throughout the city. Uh, and I truly mean that as an organizer. I know that when we, talk, when I talk about community benefits in all of these partnerships, be at UVM or elsewhere in the city, that we need to hear from you. But your engagement needs to be feel meaningful, and we have to be able to um, act upon the stuff that, that that you're telling city leaders to do. And that's not been working now. I think we need to completely relook at how we engage folks, um, have it be predictable, have it, have it be accessible, looking at our MPAs, the neighborhood planning assemblies, giving them an update. They're as old as I am at this point. And so we really, you all deserve to have a system and a city government that is responsive so that we know what your priorities are, whether it be about budgeting or what we should be doing with UVM or how we should be handling housing developments like City Place. Um, your voices truly do matter. And I want you to feel like City Hall is your City Hall, that is a safe place to engage, that it is that your city leaders are going to listen to you and not just listen to folks who are sort of the echo chamber of folks who agree with us, because that's an important thing uh, for us to model as leaders and for, for us to build those relationships I talked about before where we can work through difference. Thank you. There's a large number of faculty, students, and staff who are struggling with affordability. How will you address this as mayor? I think I kept track last time. I think I'm first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So I said it before, uh, residents of all income levels deserve to be able to work and live in Burlington, and we're, we're losing that. We've already lost people who can't afford to stay here. Um, and so I think we need to have solutions that really look at both renters and homeowners in our city to make sure we're moving with uh, a real commitment to affordability. One of those ideas I've talked about since the beginning is really looking at our local tax system and making sure that it is um, equitable. So looking at adding an income sensitized component 
component to our local tax system, our local municipal tax, much like our state education tax system. That would be that would benefit uh, low and moderate income folks. It would also benefit folks on fixed incomes. I would love for my parents to move to Burlington, but there's no way they could sell their house in Barrie and afford anything here without something like that in place. Um, I also know that we have a lot to do with expanding our grand list so that there's not a disproportional amount of impact on residential property taxpayers like there is today. And anyone who has been here long enough knows the last reappraisal process really revealed a lot of inequities within our system. So we need to look at this in a comprehensive way. And lastly, just on renters, since over 60% of folks in Burlington are renters, rent stabilization is a critical thing for us to get our hands around. And what I mean by rent stabilization is really working with the property owners who are landlords who want to do the right thing, who are doing the right thing right now to keep rents low and stable and not looking to make a profit. Housing should not be a commodity. When I say housing is a human right, I stand up for really making that a reality for renters so that folks have a transparent process around eviction. That's the just cause eviction piece that I've been still trying to push through the legislative process. Um, folks, folks need that dignity and that fair process in housing as we also work on taking, um, cooling off the, the dramatic increase in rents. Uh, we, have, we can do this and more, but we have to really be honest around what it will take to put those structural affordability measures in place in Burlington. Thank you, Emma. Joan, please. The thing that is most driving unaffordability um, in Burlington and in Vermont is housing costs. Um, and I don't think people even fully appreciate just how much housing cost has, has gone up, especially people who are homeowners and have been able to stabilize their housing costs. But I will tell you that from uh, 2019 to 2000, uh, 2024, housing costs for people who need mortgages um, who need to finance the, the bulk of um, their purchase on a house, the housing cost has gone up about 300%. The price of housing has only gone up 85%. So for people who have cash, the price has gone up 85%. But for people who need mortgages, it's gone up about 300%. And that, that has also impacted renters because that's also the cost um, of financing a multifamily property that somebody would then um, put up for rent. And when people are purchasing properties, we often see the prices escalate when a purchase happens. Um, <clears throat> So I think that people, that we need to have more home ownership in the city. Only about 30% of Burlingtonians live in owner-occupied units, and that might be a condominium or a single-family home. Uh, but the best way for people to stabilize their housing costs is through home ownership, which is inaccessible to way too many people. I support um, uh, making changes. We have a condominium conversion ordinance that prevents con prevents apartments com from converting to condominiums. And I support changing that so that people would be able to buy the apartment that they live in. And we might be able to come up with programs or grants that also help them with the down payment, which is the greatest barrier to doing that. But um, people of color have been denied the opportunity to build wealth through home ownership for generations. We need to overcome that, and we need to provide more opportunities for people to get into home ownership stabilize their housing costs. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Emma, please. Thank you. Uh, Joan, I appreciate that last point because I was going to talk about the disproportional impact on a hot housing market uh, that is so unaffordable to marginalized folks. That includes um, black, indigenous, people of color. It includes queer folks. It includes folks who live with disabilities. We know that these folks just economically um, have uh, less means about them and often have to do, use financing if, even if they can find their way to home ownership and also find a home. Um, but I think that the city needs to acknowledge the fact that we have I believe I have this number right. Fact check me. I know I'm at the university. We have literally five black homeowners in the city of Burlington. Five, five. And so I think we, we've heard this on the state um, on the state level to understand that this is a, a, a byproduct of generational lack ability to build generational wealth, racism in within how we've done zoning and housing, um, including single family um, zoning, which has been in Burlington for decades now. We're slowly starting to change that with the neighborhood code process that's underway. But in order to, it's almost, it is a reparation 
Exploration Act to actually think consciously as a city about how we can partner and ex build upon a program that CHT, Champlain Housing Trust, has started to actually find meaningful pathways for uh, BIPOC folks to actually find their ways into home ownership. Thank you, Emma. Joan, please. Um, thank you. Yeah, that is a great program that Emma just re referenced with CHT. And it's been, um, oddly enough, the uh, fair housing laws have actually worked against some of these initiatives, which is something that we have to overcome. I've tried to work with lenders to get more programs like that, but I think we need to, um, you know, start with that CHT program, build on that as an example. And also, we really need more housing. Is the, is the bottom line. We need more housing. We need more inventory. It isn't just the cost, but where are you going to find it? And with the increased, um, with increased in in interest rates, people who are in housing can't even leave that housing and move to other housing because they would be paying a much higher. Even if the price of the house was the same, they'd be paying much more on a monthly basis um, because of the cost of the mortgage. So there are several initiatives that I have been supportive of, including the South End Innovation District, which will add 800 to 1,000 units in what's currently a parking lot in the South End. And I think we need um, more we need to find more opportunities like that. Thanks. Okay, next question. How will you ensure that the democratic process is respected going forward, including both for public forum and put it, putting ballot measures on the ballot? Jim, please. Okay. Um, the city council uh, allows for public forum, which is uh, part of state law. State law requires that the public be allowed to weigh in on matters that are on our agenda. And the city council has always allowed a much more uh, robust conversation, not limited to just things that are, on, that are on the ballot. And the council rules allowed for 30 minutes of public forum so that we could get to the rest of our business. Um, more recently, the city council changed that because we weren't very good at adhering to 30 minutes ever. And so we decided let's, let's be a little bit more realistic about how much public forum we'll have. So we extended that to, we had a rules committee, the rules committee, um, which was a tripartisan committee, uh, agreed to, we should extend this to 60 minutes. It got to the council floor, we extended it to 90 minutes. And sometimes we still have more people who would like to speak to us than, than that. I think the Burlington City Council listens to more members of the public than any public body in the state of Vermont. But there does come a point in time when we have to do the business of the city while we are still awake. We all have other full-time jobs. Um, the le meeting last Monday night did not have a lengthy public forum and it lasted seven hours, a continuous seven hours of meeting. That is a lot. There are many ways for you to voice your, your opinions to the city council. You can email us. You can put a letter on the agenda. I encourage people to do that. Um, there comes a point when really everything that needs to be said has been said, just not everybody has said it. And and so I have been supportive of staying to the 90 minutes that we agreed to, and I think that does allow for an abundance of, uh, of opinions at the table. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. Emma, please. Thank you. Um, I, I know we can do better. I know we can do better. It's the way that, uh, first of all, the way that we have set up the process for some very big decisions, especially in the last eight months. I don't know if y'all noticed, but it feels like some very big decisions are moving like a freight train at 100 miles an hour um, through our process. And so we can and should be slowing down the process and expanding out the opportunities for folks to engage beyond an action-packed um, public comment period that's timed with too many 
minutes and gives people no me really meaningful engagement with their city councilors in the process itself when folks, if you think about it, you know the decision has already been made. So we have to slow down and expand this process. I mentioned before around the MPAs being looked at and really creating a more meaningful place for that engagement and most importantly for city leadership to be listening to all of you. And beyond that, we, we go through big projects all the time. There should be a predictable and user-friendly way that folks know, despite what city department is, how to engage and provide feedback, especially if it's in your own neighborhood. Um, I will say as someone with small kids, I have found it really hard in the last eight years to get to a city council meeting, and I have all the economic privileges. I could hire a babysitter, I could bring the kids, I guess, if necessary, though I don't recommend it with my four-year-old. He would grab all the microphones and talk <laughs> endlessly. Um, but truly, I mean, we, we have to make sure that we also understand, even now, though I don't think it's working, show it's only the folks with the most privileges able to even show up in Contois to provide that public comment that's, oh, that's timed down to two minutes. It's not great democracy right now, and you all deserve better. Um, as an organizer, I have plenty of ideas, but as a mayor, um, I will recognize when I will remember the days I was a city councilor, it is an impossible job, and I will work in partnership with the council to work on uh, finding ways to have workable agendas. People do have to work outside that job, supporting folks to get the information they need. Again, expanding and slowing down the process so you all have time mm -hmm. to actually engage with your constituents so you can make the best decision and not default um, to only talking to the handful of folks who are the folks that are the easiest to reach, right? Um, for us to really do better, we have to recognize the system right now needs a lot of work. Thank you, Emma. Joan, please. Um, I will say I think we th that it is right to rely on other avenues of accessing the process other than the public forum. Um, and the city does try, uh, sometimes more successfully than other times, to have a variety of public engagement um, opportunities. I think we have to be careful about how we define privilege because I will say we hear from people from all walks of life at City Council. We have heard from people who are living unsheltered. Um, we hear really from everybody, but the people who are most challenged actually are folks who have young children at home. Um, and while we might be privileged in certain ways, it's awfully hard to get to a city council meeting when it's dinner time and bedtime and uh, you have all of those struggles. It's also hard to serve as a city councilor when you have a young family and this should be a job that's accessible to more people. So I think we have to keep that in mind as well. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. Emma, please. So I, I define um, privilege as not only economics, but also when folks hold a marginalized identity and also recognizing that these city council meetings have become so heated and divisive. Harm is constantly happening to folks and it is not a safe place that even if you're able to return, that you probably want to return. I've heard unfortunate stories around um, when, because things have gotten so um, tense and harmful there that you'll be standing next to someone who's disagreeing with you on the issue and when especially these underpinnings of issues of racism and issues of transformation phobia that have gone by the council just even in the last year, it becomes a very hostile place to even express your views. Not everyone is showing up to that room with the same ability to even communicate without being activated from prior trauma. Um, and as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, for example, I have not felt, felt held or protected in that space when folks are saying transphobic things or homophobic things. Um, I think the city needs to do a lot more around allyship, and that means, again, more than performative, performative actions, but a real action to make sure they're creating that livable community for people and taking, again, the tension and the harm out of that city hall environment and doing the repair work that we need for folks who've been harmed so they can feel like they can come back and to engage their city and have those safe spaces to have that, that, um, those conversations of understanding and healing. Okay. So now we're going to have two-minute summations on each side, and since Emma started off, I'm going to ask Joan to start. Okay. Um, I, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I ask for your vote as mayor if you share my vision to improve public safety by rebuilding our police department, diversifying safety services, and partnering with others to provide the needed social safety net to meet community health, mental health, housing, and treatment needs. We need a place to live. We need to, to assure that everyone has shelter and that they can move from shelter to affordable housing, supportive housing, or supervised housing as needed. We are at our best as a community when we take care of one another. Together, we can celebrate our fabulous city and commit to helping our most vulnerable. But as a community, we all need safety. I am the candidate who has the endorsement of all four City of Burlington union, unions, representing all the union workers employed by the city. Our city workers are united in their concerns about public safety, functional governance, and the health and well-being of our staff and community. Housing and affordability are critical issues facing all sectors. We need more housing, full stop. It is the number one issue faced by all employers and most workers in our city. I have supported increased heights downtown, the South End Innovation District transformation from a parking lot to a neighborhood, and the neighborhood code allowing more housing in every neighborhood in the city. We also need to encourage the elimination of duplicative regulation that adds to the cost of housing at the state level. I want to partner with the University of Vermont to improve pu public transportation and provide housing for students and faculty. There's a near total lack of housing inventory for students and faculty that is within walking and biking distance to downtown and campus. We need UVM to come to the table to help us solve this problem, not only by building housing, but assuring that more housing is being built than enrollment is increasing for the long term. I pledge to you that I will continue to be a steward of our great lake, to continue on the roadmap to net zero, and to implement climate resiliency strategies in our city. Thank you all. I look forward to the opportunity to partner with you on our shared community issues. Thank you, Joan. Emma, please. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers and all of you for coming out tonight to hear yet another debate on this very important mayoral campaign. I have a vision for Burlington. I have a vision for Burlington that is inclusive, one that values and pri prioritizes economic diversity and knows that Burlington is a union town and a union town values its workers. I have a vision for Burlington where our city becomes a leader on responding to the climate emergency and moves with the urgency that truly a mom of two small kids can only move with, knowing that the, the reality and how Burlington's gonna look in 10 years will still be dramatically different than how it looks today. There there is a lot at stake and we have to be bolder and more innovative if we're really going to truly make a difference on our impact on climate. I have a vision for a healthy and safe community for everyone who lives here and visits here. We have to respond to the community safety issues with a comprehensive system that includes short and long term solutions that will actually work and not cause more harm police and social workers and force responders and medical professionals and community members need to be part of these critical conversations. One entity will not solve this in the end. I also have a vision that brings our community back to itself. This means having all of you feel meaningfully heard and engaged within your city in productive ways that can truly solve our big challenges together. I also have a fresh perspective with new ideas and new energy that Burlington desperately needs. I understand how to solve complex problems. I know how to dialogue with the community, especially folks who do not necessarily agree with me. This is a much needed change from the last 12 years in Burlington, and Burlington deserves better. We need a mayor who knows how to bring people together to find solutions, regardless of political labels. We need a mayor with unique skills of local and state policy experience and relationships and the know-how to engage people and really listen. We need a mayor who uses her values to lead, which includes a clear commitment to working people, marginalized folks, and Vermonters who are truly suffering on our streets. I will be that mayor. I ask for your support. Thank you so much.
So I am noticing with joy we have two women running for mayor. Let's have a big hand for both of them. Thank you all and good night.